Hello, my name is Diego Martinez. My name is Daniela Lopez. And I'm Carly. And we're, and we're the, the DJ, DJ one. This book was written as a critique slash history by Bill Brewster, a DJ from Grimsby in the UK. A lot of the focal points are focused on the scene of each genre, a scene including clubs, dancers, styles, icons, DJs, etc. Acid House shaped the British club scene before the scene was going to your favorite British pub or bar or whatever, watching people fight and then getting kicked out at 11 when it closed. Clubs closed at 2 and um, the only drugs you could have was alcohol, weed, and coke, and coke and weed were both like illegal. The scene changed after after Acid House came, and Acid House's textbook definition is music with a role in 303 bass line. This is Future's Acid Tracks, by the way, great example, but the term became a more umbrella genre for Britain's EDM scene. I really like how Brewster described the scene as, quote, the drug that took away your fear of others and clubbing moved into the center of this generation's lives, and you could say that Acid House set up the foundations for the scene today. Hip hop was huge because this was the first time that rhythm, rap vocals, as well as scratching, you know, on tracks was heard. So everyone was at first like, what is this? But they wanted more of it. So DJ Noel Watson flew out to New York to grab these records to bring them back to the UK in the 80s. These listed are some of the most notable songs that helped define the genre. DJ Dave Durrell did the same thing with house music when it first dropped. In New York, he would he would spin house music at clubs and everyone was so scared and confused, it would keep the floor empty for blocks of time. Jazz funk was considered to be what disco was for America, but in the UK. At first, it was really exclusive, you would need to seek it out. It had like a special sound to it, sort of difficult to explain to many people like, oh, this is too underground and niche, you wouldn't get it. It's a sound characterized by a strong back beat, electrified sounds, and early analog synthesizers. This genre is argued to have built the structure for Acid House by Brewster, and at its peak, it sort of started to get lame, as most things do, like in the main ballrooms of jazz funk clubs. They would be having shaving foam parties and throwing it everywhere and just listening to the same stale record, stale greatest hits record of jazz funk while the actual cool people chilled in the back rooms. But jazz funk was born in a club on Canby Island in a club called the Gold Mine. At this time, the Gold Mine would have dancers from all over coming in and sleeping in the buses in the parking lot. The club wouldn't let anyone with bad style in, especially the locals and old people. The hotbed of musical sin that you'd imagine. It's more of, well, a little club at the end of a pier with fairy lights outside, but well, it is also a hotbed of musical sin, and you can tell by the clientele they get there. Electro came out of, like, after jazz funk as it was slowly dying and evolving into electro, and it was hated so much when it came out by the jazz funk community. Once again, this was another genre that was controversially hated by the mainstream audience because it was so different. Electro is an early genre of electronic music and early hip hop directly influenced by the Roland 808 drum machines and funk. So here's a song that shook the scene. This, this is Planet Rock by Africa Bambato and the Soul Sonic Force. DJ stemmed from broadcasting, so before the scene really developed, DJs would announce each song before they played, sort of like bingo night. Meanwhile, the Americans were actually mixing on fancy equipment, using fancy lights and booths, and they even started remixing songs and getting into audio production, while the UK couldn't even mix because their equipment was falling apart. The idea of mixing seemed like a threat to the community, and even Robbie Vincent, one of the gatekeepers of jazz funk music, was against it for a while. But the new genres like hip-hop and house demanded new techniques. So Greg Wilson, one of the first DJs to actively support Electro, he was very ahead of his time, came back from New York and told everyone mixing was the future. Crackers was the place to be back in the 70s, early 70s. It was a unique place for Friday lunch times uh, between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock, playing jazz, funk and soul, disco, boogie, uh, mainly hardcore American music, uh, not commercial music, basically keeping all the youngsters away from the streets. Music was there, the dancers were there, the fashion was there. It, it was it it was mainly a club for the black youth, for the black youngsters. 80% black, 20% white. On a Sunday 
everybody wanted to be at Crackers. It's like a, it was it was the place to be. It was uh, uh, unique. The fashion was there. The best dancers that were there, males and females, males dancing together, um, females dancing together. And on Sunday it was like, for them was the Sunday church for the music. George Powers was this dude that played jazz funk and brought a mixed gay crowd with them. It was his energy that made Crackers what it was. The embassy, the embassy, I quote, it was rich gay Britons consciously copying what they'd seen in New York who brought mixing to the UK. What more can I say? It was the most beautifully restored ballroom that had previously housed exiled Russians. And Greg James, the resident who was only there for six months, installed the sound system himself. So he made that club. Finally, the royalty. This was huge in the jazz funk era. Froggy was one of the first DJs to use mixing techniques. This was the club that housed crazy jazz funk ballroom parties. And this is where straight people in the mainstream fell in love with jazz funk. Speaking of the demographic, there was this was another club where it was like urban meets suburban and black meets white and everyone's dancing, including the straight people. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Bye. Acid House wouldn't have much of an impact without the clubs that brought it to the people. Here are some notable Acid House nightclubs. First one up, we have Shoom. Shoom started in December 1987 by DJ Danny Rampling and his wife Jenny. They rented out an old fitness center and turned it into a nightclub. One of the main performers was Carl Cox, who I'll talk about in a second, and he introduced London to Acid House. Next up, we have Spectrum, which was later named as Land of Oz. It was started by club promoter and DJ Paul Oakenfield in April 11, 1988. They held many parties on Mondays, and they got their main star with the help of ecstasy, which brought many people to their club. Next up, we have Hedonism. Hedonism is often credited as the blueprint of rave culture, since it was the first warehouse event that played house music. They would hold lots of one-off free parties in West London from February to May of 1988. Next, we have Clink Street, which was an old abandoned street in London, but it was later turned into a party central. There would be weekly RIP parties, which stood for Revolution in Progress, started by Paul Stone and Lou Volkovich in June 1988. These parties played more grungy and hard music and had a darker tone in them. Another club was The Dungeon, which was located in East London. It was started by Rob Atkinson and Lyndon C. in 1988. Parties would take place in vaulted cellars under a pub, since it was a secluded location to dodge the cops from stopping the parties. One popular club was the Hacienda, which opened in May 21, 1981 by Bernard Manning. It was later then managed by Tony Wilson of Factory Records and Rob Gredin, who was the manager of New Order. It started growing more in 1986 when house music was being introduced to the UK. Last but not least, we have The Trip, which opened in June 4, 1988 in Astoria by Nick Holloway. It brought Acid House to West London and would bring in a bunch of people, sometimes up to 3,000 every weekend. Everyone knows you can't have a club without a DJ, so here are some popular Acid House DJs. First up, we have DJ Pierre, who was the main pioneer and inventor of Acid House. He made the track Acid Tracks, which was the first Acid House record to be published, and he popularized the Acid House bassline with the Roland TB303 bass synthesizer. Next up, we have Carl Cox. Carl Cox was a British DJ and producer, and he brought Acid House to the UK. Some notable songs of his are Acid Charge and a remix of DJ Pierre's Acid Tracks. Another DJ is Lil Lewis, who's a Chicago-based DJ and producer. He's best known for his track French Kiss, which charted at number one on the Billboard Hot Dance Music and Club charts in 1989. Last but not least, we have Tony Wilson. Tony Wilson was a British DJ, as well as a nightclub owner and record label owner. He performed at the Future Club and introduced that club to Acid House. Acid House introduced the world to new sounds and new subgenres. One of them was indie dance, which blended the guitars of progressive rock with the funky drums of House and Acid House. Some notable bands were Happy Mondays, The Stone Roses, The Charlatans, The Inspiro Carpets, and Northside. Another genre was Acid Jazz, which was started by Giles Peterson and Chris Banks. Acid Jazz was born when Giles Peterson and Chris Banks had a gig at a club, and they decided to mix Acid House with soul and funk records, as well as jazz records. One thing that added a lot to the history of Acid House was the Rare Groove warehousing. What is Rare Groove, you may ask? Rare Groove is jazz or soul music that contains elements of other genres such as R&B, funk, jazz funk, and subgenres such as reggae, disco, rock, etc. These times were known as the psychedelic times. And on KISS 94 FM, the first legal UK radio station that specialized in black and dance music, hosted a show called the Original Rare Groove Show. 
spreading the explosion of early 80s fashion and music throughout all of the UK, making it to West London. The fashion during these times was a bit more lively and exuberant, as people were getting out of the British punk scene and wearing things such as kilts, ruffled skirts, and heroic style outfits. And the black community was shifting their style based on New York fashion and music such as having exaggerated afros and bringing new bands with retro sounds to the UK scene. Although a problem that occurred was that door policies at the acid house, warehouse events, or raves were often racist and put limits on the black youth that could attend. And along with this issue, Rare Groove had such a strong foothold in London, it prevented house music from being played literally anywhere. According to the book, it says that it wasn't because they didn't like house music, they just didn't need it. But in actuality, they really didn't like house music. And being associated with it often left the assumption that you're gay and homophobia added onto the dislike towards the genre. But very slowly did house music make its way towards the top. This only happened until Freddie Lakers, an airline owner in the 70s, made flights to New York and back to the UK cheap and affordable. That led to London being exposed to gay New York and resulted in the style of wearing check shirts, bushy mustaches, Levi 501s, known as the clone look across the Atlantic. San Francisco and New York were way ahead of London when it came to being open to the gay community at clubs and bars. And although London had a flourishing gay community, there wasn't a purposely gay club built until 1975. And this club was called Bang. It brought fashionistas to the scene and DJs at the more alternative clubs on gay nights started to add Chicago and Detroit records to their mix. Pyramid, which happened on Wednesdays at the Heaven Night Club, and Jungle, which happened on Mondays at Busby's Night Club, were heavily promoted by Kevin Millens and Steve Swindles. And along with this, on gay nights, they were playing house music without even realizing it because they intentionally didn't want to play generic, upbeat music. House is electronic dance music with elements that involve hip hop, techno, dub, etc. And two of the UK's DJs to first play house music was Mark Moore and Colin Fever. Moore would then eventually create one of the first UK house tracks, using records from Chicago and spent his time dedicated towards breaking the stereotypes that came along with the genre. He also did it mostly because people really didn't like house music, like they absolutely hated it, and it would get violent if the crowd didn't like what they heard. But the only thing being listened to at clubs and bars was hip hop and rare groove music, and this also led to a separation between the North and the South, and what should be listened to and what shouldn't be listened to at these places. During 1987, there was a shift in the air. To everyone, it felt like an era coming to an end, and the conservative government in the UK was having a hard time dealing with the economy and the democracy movements that were thriving over all of Eastern Europe. The event that led to the failing government was the stock market crash on October 19, 1987, called Black Monday. This left many with mortgages higher than their homes were worth and was falling into an age of depression and fending for oneself. This event led to the idea being passed around society was that in order to succeed, you had to detach yourself from any collective spirit. There is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. The only way to enter the clubs was if you changed and looked completely different from your regular clothes. You couldn't just walk in, you had to dress to impress. At this point, house music wasn't too big to make a huge thing for itself, but the people that did discover and enjoy it built a community that was steadily growing. Two influential house advocates were Irish DJ brothers Noel and Maurice Watson. Maurice was a master tailor and had a job working for the fashion company D-Mop, whereas Noel was DJing at the exquisite D-Mop parties from 1982. Eventually, they were becoming so popular they needed to get new tracks for the crowds to listen to. In 1986, when Maurice came back from New York, he brought a record bag full of house tracks. But when they started playing these tracks at the primarily hip-hop club Delirium at Asteria, they were getting yelled at and even had to put a cage around the DJ boots in order to protect them from flying bottles. And eventually, Delirium closed and Maurice moved to New York before he could see the effect that him and his brother had on house. 
DJ Danny Rumpling saw the spark that the DJs created with House. Believing that he had a spiritual experience with it, he also believed that the reason people didn't enjoy it was because they were consuming the wrong drugs. Although the North and South were divided because of House, the North didn't wait for the South to catch up. In clubs and bars in the North, they played house music and brought records from Chicago and Detroit, and also electronic and techno to the mix as well. In the South clubs and bars, they were only listening to rare groove, hip hop, and early 80s synth pop bands. One thing that changed the face of music for everyone within these genres was when DJ Trevor Funk went to Ibiza. He was there to DJ at multiple clubs, and from there he stumbled upon something evolutionary ecstasy. He had tried it first in 1986, and by the end of 1987, he was ready to show London Ibiza's party secrets. He had his friends, DJs Paul Oakenfold, Danny Rumpling, Don Walker, and party promoter Ricky Holloway visiting him in Ibiza. To which then, Trevor took his friends to a bar and they had the best night of their lives. The night all of a sudden turned into a sparkling, colorful, and extravagant event. Everyone dancing furiously to the electronic music. Once the end of the week came, they were on their way to London to share this experience with everyone. Ecstasy shaped the whole club experience. It gave people confidence and energy. It enhanced the way you viewed the lights or listened to music and your environment. It allowed people to let loose and feel secure in who they are. It made people want to appreciate other people. Europe ended up having a huge number of youth taking drugs and all the while in the US, ecstasy was made illegal. Before it was made illegal, at the club The Stark in Dallas, Texas, it had became famous because it was selling ecstasy at the bar and had drug waiters wearing shirts that said in all caps, buy my XTC, within the last year of the drug being legal. The drug previously wasn't seen as a party drug in the UK. If anything, it was seen as a designer drug for cocktail parties. But even then so, the usage of it was almost nothing until it reached the clubs. House music became something that was hated to loved in an instant. People started to feel that they didn't have to dress a certain way, but can dress the way they wanted to. Paul Oakenfold then went to indie record shops and would share his playlist of house music. It was a new vibe and it didn't need much promotion to become huge the minute that Nikki Holloway switched up his night show from rare groove and hip hop to house. By the summer of 1988, this new wave of experiencing house music was all over the papers.